Hello! In this video, we are going to prove the following theorem. Suppose A is equinumerous with B, and C is equinumerous with D. If A and C are disjoint, and B and D are disjoint, then A or C is equinumerous with B or D. Okay, so let's start by supposing that A is equinumerous with B, and C is equinumerous with D. And what we want to do now is prove that if this is true, then this is true. So let's suppose this is true. And our whole goal now is to deduce that A or C is equinumerous with B or D. And what that means is, is we want to find a function from A or C to B or D that is bijective. Now, we know that A is equinumerous with B. So there is a function from A to B that is bijective. I'll call that function f. And similarly, since C is equinumerous with D, we know that there is a function from C to D that is bijective. I'll call that function g. Okay, so I've just written those functions up here for safekeeping. Okay, now the claim is that f or g is a bijective function from A or C to B or D. Okay, so then how do we actually prove that f or g is a bijective function from A or C to B or D? Well, we're going to do this in a three-step process. First, we're going to show that f or g is a relation from A or C to B or D. Then we're going to show f or g is a function from A or C to B or D. And then finally, we'll show that f or g is a bijective function from A or C to B or D. Okay, so let's start by showing that f or g is a relation from A or C to B or D. And what does this mean? Well, really, we're trying to show that f or g is a subset of A or C times B or D. And to prove this, let's give ourselves an arbitrary element of f or g. Now, every element of f or g is an ordered pair. The reason why is because everything in f or g is either in f or it's in g. But everything in f is an ordered pair, and everything in g is an ordered pair. So that's why everything in f or g is an ordered pair. So let's say that our arbitrary element of f or g is the ordered pair p comma q. Okay, now our whole goal is to deduce that p comma q is also an element of a or c times b or d. And we're going to break this up into two cases. Either p comma q is an element of f, or p comma q is an element of g. And what we're going to do is we're going to prove in either case we have that p comma q is also an element of a or c times b or d. Let's start with case one where p comma q is an element of f. Now we know that f is a subset of a times b. And we know that a times b is a subset of a times b or c times d. And then if you recall, in general, this is actually a subset of a or c times b or d. And the proof of this, I'll leave in the description below. And so yeah, this shows that p comma q is also an element of a or c times b or d. Exactly what we wanted. So now we're going to move on to case two, where p comma q is an element of g. Now, g is a subset of c times d, and c times d is a subset of a times b or c times d. But as mentioned above, we know that this is a subset of a or c times b or d. And so this shows us that p comma q is also an element of a or c times b or d, exactly what we wanted. So in either case, p comma q is an element of a or c times b or d. So putting this all together, we started with an arbitrary element of f or g, and we deduced that that same element is also an a or c times b or d. So this proves exactly this statement. In other words, we've proven that f or g is a relation from a or c to b or d. So now that we've shown f or g is a relation from a or c to b or d, now we want to show f or g is a function from a or c to b or d. Okay. 
Okay, so what does this mean? What it means is we're trying to prove for every element P in A or C, there is a unique element Q in B or D such that P comma Q is an element of F or G. So really, this is the statement we're trying to prove. And we're trying to prove a statement about all elements in A or C. So give me an arbitrary element of A or C. I'll call it P. Okay, so we're gonna break this up into two cases. Either P is an element of A or P is an element of C. And what we're gonna do is we're going to prove in either case, there is a unique element Q in B or D such that P comma Q is an element of F or G. Let's start with case one where P is an element of A. Now, because P is an element of A, and A and C are just joint, this means that A and C have no elements in common. Therefore, because P is an element of A, we must have that P is not an element of C. And also, because P is an element of A, and F is a function from A to B, we know that F has a functional value at P. We could say, for instance, let Q equal F of P. And we know that the functional values of F are elements of B, so f of p is an element of B, and we know that B is a subset of B or D. But this is equivalent to saying that p comma q is an element of f, and f is a subset of f or G. So notice what has happened here. We have found an element q in B or D such that p comma q is an element of f or G. So this proves the existence portion. Now we want to prove that the element Q that we found is unique. That is, we want to show that Q is the only element of B or D such that P comma Q is an element of F or G. How do we do that? Well, we're going to prove that every element in B or D that has the same property as Q is equal to Q. So what we're going to do is we're going to give ourselves an arbitrary element in B or D. I'll call it Z, such that P comma Z is an element of F or G. And so to prove uniqueness, what we want to do is we want to prove that Z is equal to Q. And to see why that's the case, let's start by noting that P is not an element of C. Because P is not an element of C, clearly that means P comma Z is not an element of C times D. Right? This clearly must be true, because if instead we had p comma z is an element of c times d, we would have p is an element of c, which that's not the case. Okay, but what can we say from here? Well, remember, g is a subset of c times d, meaning everything in g is also in c times d. By the contrapositive, that means everything that's not in c times d is also not in g. And therefore, this means p comma z is not in g. So notice, p comma z is an element of f or g, but not an element of g. Therefore, p comma z must be an element of f. But now, we have p comma q is an element of f, and p comma z is an element of f. Because f is a function, p must map to a unique value. In other words, we must have that Q is equal to Z. And so this proves uniqueness, right? Because at first we found an element Q in B or D such that P comma Q is an element of F or G. And then we gave ourselves an arbitrary element of B or D that has the same property that Q has. And we show that arbitrary element Z must be equal to Q. And so, yeah. This proves that there is a unique element Q in B or D such that P comma Q is an element of F or G in the case where P is an element of A. Now, we're going to prove that we get the same result if P is an element of C. Okay, and I've written a dot 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 here just to indicate that there's more details that came before this. Okay, now if P is an element of C, then, because A and C are disjoint, we know that P is not an element of A. And also, 
because p is an element of c, and g is a function from c to d, this means g has a functional value at p. We could say, for instance, let q equal g of p. And the functional values of g are elements of d. So g of p is an element of d. And we know that d is a subset of b or d. But also notice, this is equivalent to saying p comma q is an element of g. And g is a subset of f or g. So notice what we've done here. We have found an element q in b or d such that p comma q is an element of f or g. So this proves that there is an element q in b or d such that p comma q is an element of f or g. Now we want to prove that this element q that we found is unique. That is, we want to show that q is the only element of b or d that satisfies this condition. And to show that that's the case, well, let's give ourselves an arbitrary element z in b or d such that p comma z is an element of f or g. And again, to prove that q is unique, we want to show that q is equal to z. So to do that, well, let's first note that p is not an element of a. And since p is not an element of a, we know for a fact that p comma z is not an element of a times b. Okay, and next, well, what can we say from here? Well, because f is a subset of a times b, this means everything in f is also in a times b. And the contrapositive of that says everything that's not in a times b is also not in f. This means p comma z is not in f. So putting this together, because p comma z is an element of f or g, but not in f, we can say p comma z is an element of g. So now we see that p comma q is in g and p comma z is in g. Since g is a function, p must map to a unique value through the function g. Therefore, q must be equal to z. And so again, this proves that q is unique. And so in either case, we have shown that our arbitrary element p has a unique value q in b or d such that p comma q is an element of f or g. So we have proven precisely this statement, which means we have proven that f or g is in fact a function from a or c to b or d. Okay, so now that we've shown f or g is a function from a or c to b or d, now we want to show that f or g is a bijective function from a or c to b or d. And to show that f or g is bijective, we can do that by showing that f or g is both injective and surjective. Let's start by showing that f or g is injective. So what does this mean? Well, really, what we're trying to prove is this. So really, we're trying to prove for every two input values to the function f or g, if their output values are equal, then their input values are equal. So that's the idea. And we're trying to prove a statement about every two elements of a or c. So give me any two elements of a or c. I'll call them p1 and p2. And now we're going to prove if this is true, then this is true. So let's suppose this is true. That is, we're supposing the output values of these two elements are equal. Now for convenience, let's just say that these two things are equal to q. So another way of looking at this is we could say p1 comma q is an element of f or g and p2 comma q is an element of f or g. Now we're going to break this up into two cases. We know that q is an output value of the function f or g. So q must be an element of b or d. So really our two cases is going to be either q is an element of b or q is an element of d. And what we're going to do is we're going to prove in either case we have that p1 is equal to p2. Let's start with case one where q is an element of b. Now if q is an element of b, well since b and d are disjoint we must have that q is not an element of d. So really since q is not an element of d 
That means P1, Q is not an element of C times D, and P2, Q is not an element of C times D. So now that we know that, remember, if you're not an element of C times D, then you're not an element of G. So P1, Q is not an element of G, and P2, Q is not an element of G. So really, since P1, Q is an element of F or G, but not in G, this means P1, Q must be an element of F. And similarly, since P2, Q is an element of F or G, but not an element of G, this means P2, Q must be an element of F. And another way of writing these is to say Q equals F of P1 and Q equals F of P2. And therefore, F of P1 equals F of P2. So really, since F is injective, from here we can conclude that P1 is equal to P2. So really, we've proven exactly what we wanted to prove. So this completes case one. Now we're going to move on to case two, where Q is an element of D. Now, since Q is an element of D and B and D are disjoint, we can conclude that Q is not an element of B. But then, since Q is not an element of B, we must have that P1, Q is not an element of A times B and P2, Q is not an element of A times B. But remember, if you're not an element of A times B, then you aren't an element of F. So really we have that P1, Q is not an element of F and P2, Q is not an element of F. And now, because P1, Q is an element of F or G, but not an element of F, we can conclude that P1, Q is an element of G. Similarly, since P2, Q is an element of F or G, but not an element of F, this means P2, Q is an element of G. And from here, we can write that Q equals G of P1 and Q equals G of B2. But then since G is injective, from G of P1 equals G of P2, we can write that P1 is equal to P2. And so we have proven P1 is equal to P2, exactly what we wanted to prove. And in either case, we have P1 is equal to P2. So putting this all together, we start with two arbitrary elements of A or C, and we assume their output values through the function f or g are equal. From there, we are able to deduce that P1 is equal to P2. So we have proven exactly this statement, which means we have proven that f or g is in fact injective. So next, we're going to prove f or g is surjective. What does it mean for f or g to be surjective? Well, if you recall, all that means is for every element q in b or d, there is an element p in a or c, such that p comma q is an element of f or g. So really, this is what we want to prove. And we're trying to prove a statement about every element in b or d, so give me an arbitrary element of b or d. I'll call it Q. And let's break this up into two cases. Either Q is an element of B or Q is an element of D. What we're going to do is we're going to prove in both cases we have an element P in A or C such that P comma Q is an element of F or G. Let's start with case one where Q is an element of B. Now since Q is an element of B, remember f is a surjective function, which means for every element in b, there is an element in a that maps onto the element in b through the function f. So really, since q is an element of b, we can choose some element p in a, such that p comma q is an element of f. But remember, a is a subset of a or c and f is a subset of f or g. And now we see that we have found an element p in a or c such that p comma q is an element of f or g, which means 
we have proven this. And so this completes case one. Now let's move on to case two where Q is an element of D. Now in this case, Q is an element of D. And since G is surjective, we know that for every element in D, there is an element in C that maps onto the element in D through the function G. So since Q is an element of D, we can choose some element P in C such that P comma Q is an element of G. But remember, C is a subset of A or C, and G is a subset of F or G. So we see we have found an element P in A or C such that P comma Q is an element of F or G. So we have proven precisely this statement. So putting this together, we start with an arbitrary element Q in B or D, and in either case, we have proven there is an element P in A or C such that P comma Q is an element of F or G. So we have proven precisely this statement, which means we have proven F or G is surjective. So we have shown that our function F or G is both injective and surjective, which means our function F or G is bijective. And so because we have found a function from A or C to B or D that is bijective, this means that A or C is equinumerous with B or D which is exactly what we wanted to prove. And so this completes the proof. And so, yeah, this is pretty much how you could prove this theorem. And so, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.